was also true in saying that as bad as they are, the New York City Democrats are worse. So we've got to keep that Republican Senate intact. So how do you deal with the fact that there were five upstate turncoats that should have voted for John D. Francisco, and we still, we don't want to get rid of them and replace them with Democrats? The word is primaries. Now, there were two Republicans from the Hudson Valley, Senators Larkin and Senator Paloma, what's the other guy's name? Uh, it begins with an F. Uh, I'll think of it in a second. But we don't care about them because they're Hudson Valley. But there were three from right around here in upstate New York who voted against John Francisco, and four John Flanagan who voted for the SAFE Act. It is essentially like a dog on a leash with Andrew Cuomo. Mike Mazzolio, Jim Seward, and Kathy Young. Along with, his name is Farley, Senator Farley and Senators Larkin. They were bought off. They sold their souls and voted for John Flanagan instead of John D. Francisco because Andrew Cuomo made the phone calls. He offered them, I call them trinkets. He offered them grants for road repairs in their districts or a new hospital wing or a new truck for the fire department or whatever it is that they want, they're going to get for their district because they sold their votes and gave it to Andrew Cuomo and voted for his boy, John Flanagan. You know, John Flanagan used to be in the assembly, and he ran for the Republican leadership in the assembly, and he lost. That was before I got there. So I asked some of the old timers, why didn't you vote for John Flanagan? And he said, this one fellow said, I got two words for you, Eddie Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Andy Haskell from Leave It to Beaver? The guy that would tell you whatever you wanted to hear? The guy that would do whatever you wanted to do? That's John Flanagan. And that is who Jim Seward, Mike Mazzolio, and Kathy Young voted for. Now, Paloma bought, brought a yard sign that says Repeal Mazzolio on it. And where do I get mine? And I think we got to start selling these through the gun clubs and through any organization that will have them through this chapter of scope and throughout Mike Mazzolio's district. We gotta find somebody to run against Jim Seward, who's a little bit east of here. Jim Seward, Jim Seward votes for a guy who voted for the same pack. Jim Seward represents Ilian, which is the home of Remington for over 100 years. And is now losing jobs because we're sending 2,000 jobs to a southern state for a new Remington factory because people like Mario Cuomo and now his son Andrew Cuomo and John Flanagan and the turncoat Republicans from Long Island voted for the same act. We should have one message for Jim Seward. Repeal Seward. We should have one message for Mike Mazzolio. Repeal Mazzolio. Thank you. 
the message next year. We need to find candidates to run against those Republicans. We need to take back some of these assembly seats, especially those around Syracuse that are occupied by Democrats who all voted for the same thing. And we need to make sure our voices are heard. Now, let me tell you about the voices that are heard. I'm going to disagree with the senator a moment ago about something he said, which is that we can't get things done because of New York City. Here's a statistic to remember, 37%. 37% of the people in New York City cannot vote because they are either illegal immigrants or they are first generation and they don't have the right to vote as citizens of the United States. So you take all over a third of the population of New York City, that number right off the top, and you do the numbers and you'll find that the majority of people who vote for governor are actually north of New York City or in upstate. So why don't we win more of these elections? We ran through these numbers with Donald Trump. I saw a Trump t-shirt there in the back of the room. A small group of us had five meetings with Donald Trump at the end of 2013 and into 2014 to try to convince him to run for governor of New York. He's a numbers guy. So we took out every 62 counties and we showed the census population, the registered voter population, and the number of people who actually turned out in 2010, Palladino versus Cuomo, and, two, and then we also updated it recently for 2014, Astorino versus Cuomo, 61% of the vote is north of Westchester County. You know why they keep winning? They vote as a block. We're all over the place or we don't show up. I had a state senator, a Republican, go to a scope rally in the western part of the state. And you know these petitions that the politicians do, where you sign a petition, tell the governor you don't like to say fact? That's not really a petition. I suppose it is technically, but what it really is, what we call data harvesting. They want to know who you are that oppose the safe act so that they can send you campaign literature. Nothing wrong with that. But he had this one particular senator come back to the safe act rally, had his petition with over a couple hundred names on it, people just like you. And he had an office intern do a cross-check of those names against the voter registration numbers, or polls, or the voter registration list. 61% of the people at a safe act, anti-safe act, scope rally were not registered to vote. That's why we're losing elections. And that's why the Andrew Cuomo's can laugh at us and say, ah, those people in upstate New York, they don't matter because they don't show up. We have got to make sure that every one of our neighbors, our family members, anybody that we know that cares about the Second Amendment or our rights is registered to vote and votes. I've heard the darndest excuses. I've had people say to me, oh, I don't want to go be on a jury pool. You know what? It's been about 30 years since voter registration lists were the primary source of jury pool selections, okay? They use driver's license data, they use homeowner's data, they use property tax, they use a lot of things. Just registering to vote doesn't mean you're going to be called up for jury duty. That's a lame excuse if there ever was one. I've had other people say, oh, I don't want to be on a government list. Excuse me, do you have a driver's license? You're on a government list. They're probably listening to your phone conversations this afternoon driving away from here. You know, there's no, you can't hide anymore. But by not registering to vote, you give the vote to the Andrew Cuomo's of the world. And that's exactly what he wants. There is a pattern that New York City is together on, which is to depopulate upstate New York, turn us into a giant park. Do you think the anti-manufacturing policy is an accident? The highest in the nation taxes on our heartland industries? Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Auburn, Elmira, Cornell, all solid manufacturing economies and all have been gutted. Not by foreign competition, but by our own policies that are killing us. You try to build something in upstate New York and see how many environmentalists come out of the woodwork and say, you can't build that here. We killed 20,000 jobs in the southern tier when Andrew Cuomo killed fracking. A billion dollars of investment. The border between New York and Pennsylvania has been described as being like the old Berlin Wall. One side is prosperous and booming. That would be the Pennsylvania side. The other side is an economic in the doldrums, near depression levels. That would be our side. 
I know some people that live in northern Pennsylvania. I've got some cousins down there. They're laughing all the way to the bank. And in fact, I represent a good part of Livingston County and Steuben County where all the farmland prices, any of you involved with farming, been looking at what's going, up to, going on with farmland prices? Do you know who's buying that land? People with cash from Pennsylvania. The Mennonites and the others coming up from Pennsylvania because they're cashing in their chips in Pennsylvania because of the drilling for natural gas, and they're coming up here and buying our land for pennies on the dollar. That's what's happening to the upstate New York economy, and that is because we're electing people like Jim Seward and Mike Mazzolio and Kathy Young, who vote for people from Long Island who are on a tight leash from a governor who grew up in Queens. Every elected official statewide in New York State right now grew up within a couple of miles of each other in New York City. And we intend to change that. We tried to get Donald Trump to run. We were not successful in doing that. You know why? One of the reasons he didn't run? He was very upfront with us at the very beginning. And by the way, I think he would have been a great governor. And I think he would have won the governorship. And it would have been Governor Trump now running for the presidency. But one of the reasons he didn't win is because he said, you know, your own Republican Party isn't united. Your own Republican Party is going to support Andrew Cuomo, all those senators from Long Island and New York City for governor again, because he's basically bought them off. So we need to find people here who are like John D. Francisco and are not gonna get bought off. John D. Francisco is a good man, and we need to find a few more like him, starting with people to run against Seward, Missouri, and Young, and Farley and Larkin. Let me tell you about the Constitutional Convention. The senator said, that you gotta have statewide support. Well, truth be told, New York City doesn't like Albany a whole lot more than we do. They got completely different reasons. But I think there's an opportunity in 2017, I won't go into it here, but I got two words for you to hinge on. Home rule. Home rule is a principle of constitutional government that means that counties, towns, and school districts can run themselves as opposed to having to do exactly what Albany tells them. Home rule is something that people in New York City want because they're tired of having to get the state legislature and the governor to approve everything their own mayor and city council do. Just like we here in upstate New York are tired of the governor and state education department telling our school districts and our counties and our towns about all these mandates on them that raised us, giving us the highest property taxes in America. I believe if we work together, and we're putting together a coalition as we speak, we've been working on it for a couple of months, with some folks in New York City, we are gonna come up with a home rule agenda for a constitutional convention. It's gonna be voted upon in 2017 by all of you. Uh, it's gonna be an issue in 2018, because if it passes in 17, in 2018, you will elect delegates. They are elected, elected delegates to that convention. And there's, I think it's, it's three delegates from every state senate district in the state. So maybe some of you will be on the ballot. And if we can elect the right people to be delegates to the Constitutional Convention and focus in like a laser beam on home rule, we've got a good chance of getting it passed, and then it goes statewide to a referendum. You know who's going to be opposed to it? The governor and the state legislature. They're going to say it's a bad idea. They're going to try to do what De Francisco just told us a couple of minutes ago. They've done the last couple of times, which is to poo-poo the idea loaded up with a lot of crap that people don't want to vote for, which is why we're going to have discipline with the people that are going to be delegates. So you'll be hearing more about this. There's a lot of work that's got to be done, but we've got a couple of years to do it. Let me talk about the future. Senator De Francisco also mentioned the next gubernatorial race. I got two words for you. Chris Gibson. Chris Gibson. United States Army Colonel, four deployments to Iraq, four Bronze Stars, Combat Commander, 82nd Airborne, Purple Heart. Retired from the U.S. Army after 24 years in 2009 to run for the United States Congress. He is now a third-term congressman in the Hudson Valley. He's got, by the way, Kristen Gilbert's old congressional seat. He's got that area outside of Albany to the south and along the Hudson Valley. Chris Gibson has not announced it, and I'm not here speaking for him, but I got two words for you for the gubernatorial race on the Republican line in 2018, and that's Chris Gibson. Uh, we're gonna have to do a lot better for Chris than we did for Rob Astorino. 
but that's not going to be a whole lot of challenge because he's going to, Chris Gibson's a ball of fire. He's spoken to 500 people at the Livingston County Republican Committee back in August. You could have heard a pin drop in the room by the time he was done. He's a dynamic speaker. He's got a PhD from Cornell. He's an 82nd Airborne Combat Commander. And he's the kind of person that can inspire and lead. And I believe he's going to be our candidate. And he is 100% against the SAFE Act. So that's the kind of person we can get from. Anti-gun initiatives. 
I'm not saying that this fellow running for the judgeship is one of them. I am saying that he made a decision to enroll in and run under the banner of the party that supports the SAFE Act and supports micro stamping and supports safe storage and supports mandatory insurance requirements on your homeowners for anybody that owns a gun because those are the next things coming. Everybody thinks we've got to rebuild the SAFE Act and we do. But the SAFE Act is not the end, it's the beginning. We already had this past year in the State Assembly, and it was blocked by the Republicans in the Senate, but they passed in the Assembly the uh, safe storage rules. The safe storage rules would require that every firearm in every home, even if there's no kids in the house, even if you live alone and don't like visitors, you still got to have your gun in a safe. Or else, if there's an accident, EMS comes in, fire, deputy is there, and they discover the gun in the house, it's not locked up, that's a misdemeanor offense. You would not be able to own a pistol under their new rules if they get this passed, unless you have mandatory homeowner's insurance. Now, how many people can afford mandatory homeowner's insurance on a firearm, especially living in some neighborhoods? And then there's micro stamping. They want to end the gun industry in New York State, and they know how to do it, which is what they've done in California, which is micro stamping. So if you think the safe fact is all over, I can live with it, you're wrong. The safe fact is not the end, it's the beginning. Let me talk, close up about the safe fact, and I can take any questions that you've got. Safe fact is interesting, nobody has said this. Uh, not too much yet, because frankly, a lot of people would rather sort of keep it quiet. But the SAFE Act is a monumental failure. You think about the key things in the SAFE Act. Ban on ARs. You can go to any gun shop in New York State and buy an AR, just about it looks like a paintball gun. Yes. It's the same gun, it's the same action. The registration of the ARs that we all had prior to January of 2013. At the time the Safe Act was passed, New York State Police estimated roughly a million of those firearms that were going to have to be registered. That number is consistent with National Shooting Sports Foundation, their industry data, because they track the number of firearms of different models going into dealers, FFLs, in all the different states. They said it was someplace between 950,000 and a million 50,000. So take the average, that's another, again another million. Because of Paloma Campana, who is the lawyer we're going to hear from in a few minutes, who filed a Freedom of Information request, along with Bill Robinson, who's the host of a, a radio show that also runs on many of, of our stations. <laughs> they filed a Freedom of Information request. The governor ignored them and stonewalled for a year until finally Paloma brought an action in front of a judge, and the judge says, nice try, governor, but Paloma Campana is right about this. You must release that registration data. And so he did. 44,000 out of a million. Now, even with common core math, I can figure out. <laughs> you take out the law enforcement owned, you know, the LEO firearms and the FFL owned firearms because they're subject to inspection. And that means that less than 4% of the ARs that were required to be registered in New York State have actually been registered. Giant fail. The ammunition registration, giant fail, they can't figure out how to do it. The mental health registration. The overwhelming majority of people that find themselves on the do not buy list were never gonna own a firearm to begin with. So the government, governor touts the numbers, but the numbers are largely meaningless. The fact is that almost nobody, short of somebody who probably should be in an institution, is being prevented, and those that are, Paloma's got a case challenge to that as well because it's constitutionally deficient. Once you get onto that no buy list, you can't get off of it. There's no due process. And Paloma will be telling us more about that in a few minutes. In addition, the Veterans Administration, the federal government refused to participate in the mental health registry. So you go right down the list, the key features of the SAFE Act have failed. And yet the governor is now saying, because one of his aides, who was walking on a dangerous street, drug gang infested part of, I think it was Brooklyn, at 3.40 in the morning, and gets himself shot, now the governor thinks there should be more restrictions on our gun rights. That's the mentality of this guy. 
So we're going to try to do everything we can to block them in the legislature. We've got to make sure we support people like John DeFrancisco. we got to take out the rhino Republicans like Seward, Nazolio, and Young, Farley, and Larkin. And we need to send a clear message to Albany that our voices will be heard. We're going to do home rule in 2017 and 2018 with a constitutional convention. And we're going to elect a real governor for us in upstate New York in Chris Gibson in 2018. Thank you very much. Who do you want to believe? Whose voice do you want to hear? 
And the fact is that Barack Obama did better on that score than John McCain or Mitt Romney. Going into the Republican primaries, it's who do we want to see in our living rooms for the next four years. And I think there's another deep down, very primitive level. Who do we want to be our man or woman walking into that room with Vladimir Putin? When it was Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev, you knew who was going to win. At a very primitive level inside of each of us, it's our guy or woman versus theirs. And we want somebody who's going to win. And I think part of the problem we had with Bush 41, for example, he was actually a great president on many levels. But he didn't get the sense that he had the fire in the belly, the fight in the, you know, the dog to win the fight. And that's why Bill Clinton, who convinced a lot of people he did, that's why he won that and lost Peru. Uh, so, yeah, point well taken about Ben Carson. He is one of the smartest guys in the room. And I don't think the fact that he's soft-spoken has anything to do with being president. Some of the most soft-spoken guys I know are, are some of the toughest players for Anything on you, sir? This is a walk and beat the track. Does anybody really know what this pistol permit renewal safe is going to consist of? The question is, does anybody know what the pistol permit renewal of the safe act is going to consist of? It's not technically a renewal of the permit. It's a recertification. And the difference is, a renewal is you've got to go and justify why you have it and get all the references and so on. Under the recertification, it's just saying, no, since I got this permit, A, I'm still alive. You'd be surprised at how many of these people are not alive uh, because there's no color. There's no, there's no, you know, once you, you die, there's no way to get your permit off the books in most of the counties in New York State. So it's a recertification that A, I'm alive, B, I'm not a convicted felon or haven't done anything like a restraining order from a judge that would prohibit me from having a permit. Remember, in most of the counties, it's still a paper system. Yeah. And there is no, they don't deep dive into the, you know, so a judge can say you can't have a permit anymore. There's not necessarily anybody going to make sure that that permit's removed. Uh, the, I'm not concerned about the research, except for two things. Number one, Cuomo's got the state police sticking their nose into it. It's not in the SAFE Act, but the state police are effectively developing a parallel system. Cuomo's turning the state police, by the way, into like a Praetorian Guard. I mean, if you talk to retired troopers that can talk freely, uh, or people that are currently serving, if they'll talk, you know, one-on-one -on -one off the record, uh, he is trying to politicize the state police in a way that no other governor has ever done. Uh, to the point where uh, the, a lot of the troopers are calling the superintendent of state police Captain McCluskey. Now, you all know who Captain McCluskey is? He's the guy from the Godfather movie. I mean, that is not a compliment. They do not respect the leadership. They don't respect the people working in the state police legal counsel's office. Uh, and they certainly don't respect the governor as a commander in chief. But he is, does hold that role. The state police salute him. Uh, in fact, it's funny. I was, I was having a conversation with one of the Democrats in New York City, the members lounge. And I made a comment about Cuomo. And he said, no, Jay, let me tell you something. In another time, in another place, Andrew Cuomo would be expecting all of us to salute him. That's the attitude that even his own Democrats have about him. And that's sort of what he's doing with the state police. That plus the fact that they're raising this year, they've been given direction, they're raising $40 million from tickets on the throughway and elsewhere in New York State to essentially pay for their own salaries. They're singing for their summer. And the troopers don't like it, but again, they're, they're under some pretty clear direction. So it's a bad direction that we're taking it, being turned from law in one of the best law enforcement organizations in the country uh, a long time ago into something very different today. Other questions? Yes, sir. Ms. Olio Pryor, are there any candidates stepping forward? Th there are uh, two people that I'm aware of who have, are starting to explore it. One uh, is a retired military officer, uh, U.S. Army, that just finished up uh, and, is, and is returning to this area. Uh, another is a, uh, a person that's thought about running for office. Here's the problem. Don't underestimate how hard it is to run for one of these jobs. Uh, Nizzolio's, I don't know how many counties he's got. He's, what, six counties? Uh, that's a lot of territory. I've only got three counties in my assembly district. And I'm on the road constantly. You know, as Senator referred to wanting to see his wife. Well, here I am. 
You know, my wife is home, I would be very fine with me. She's got a whole list of things she wanted me to be doing today. <laughs> but you've got to be, especially if you're going to take on a sitting or an incumbent senator, your nights and weekends are gone for nine months. I mean, you're just, you're just not going to go, you're not going to go on vacation. You're going to be at events like this in every church in the district, every Rotary Club, every Boy Scout troop throughout a six-county region. You're going to go to every fire department dinner, every ambulance quarter dinner and celebration. So you've got to be willing to sacrifice your personal time. And I, I tell people, I did have a conversation with somebody that's got a fellow with a young family. And I said, honestly, I think you'd be a great candidate. I'm not going to encourage you to run because it would be a huge disservice to your kids. They'll never see you. And that's when you're at least home sleeping in your own bed at night. Then you're in Albany from January through June, two to three days a week. So it's a tough, it's a, it's a, it, it involves a lot of personal cycle. I didn't do it until I was 55 and the kids were grown. You know, I, I volunteered on a lot of stuff, but I always slept at home at night and I, was, I had my choice of what I did evenings and weekends. You become an elected official and it's a tremendous personal commitment. You've also, let's not be naive, you've got to be able to raise money. You're going to be able to raise $100,000, either your own money, or your friends and family, because no lobbyists are going to kick into your campaign when you're challenging an incumbent. So you got to be realistic. You need to be able to raise 100 grand to be credible in a primary election. And finally, let's be honest. You got to be clean. You know, you've, if you've got anything in your background that would disqualify you in today's political world, you know, because this stuff gets ugly on the internet. You know, if you've ever had a tax lien, a personal bankruptcy. Uh, a restraining order because of a divorce situation, if you've ever been hospitalized for a mental health uh, kind of a problem. Uh, I mean, they will find out about it. That's what opposition research is all about. So if you've got a problem in your background, I mean, speeding tickets, nobody really much cares. But uh, anything uh, involving sexual harassment uh, or any kind of, of uh, criminal action, forget about it. So you gotta, you gotta have a clean record, you gotta be willing to sacrifice nights and weekends for nine months, and you gotta be able to put $100,000 in the campaign, and then finally, you gotta be able to stand up and convince people that, that you've got the, the smarts to be a New York State Senator, and stand up to the likes of this crowd in New York City. And uh, frankly, those traits in combination are very tough. But we do have a couple of people in mind that we're talking to. Uh, I don't wanna say their names yet, because I don't wanna, Float them out there without their permission. Uh, we're doing the same thing in Jim Seward's district. Kathy Young's going to be tough because she's got everybody in the southern tier convinced that you know she's she's fighting for the Second Amendment rights. Uh, uh, Farley, I know, does have a primary opponent uh, in the Hudson Valley and Larkin. That's going to be a very tough seat because there's actually a Democrat who's a very effective candidate named Jim Scoofus is going to be running against Larkin. Possibly. Uh, and I think whether Scoop is actually runs depends upon whether Larkin gets a, a strong primary opponent that would be credible. So there's a lot of dynamics in play. The Republicans might pick up a seat. There's a Buffalo seat currently held by a guy named, uh, what is it, Penapinto? Yeah, Penapinto. Pen 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 yeah. That uh, took the seat from Crisanti. It's interesting, the Republicans from upstate and the Democrats from upstate who voted for uh, the safe factor gone. Uh, Crisanti was a Republican from the Buffalo area who I first met at the annual scope dinner in 2012, I think it was. And he said, I'm going to offer your second amendment rights, and then he goes and votes for the safe factor. He's gone. And then in the Hudson Valley area, there are a couple of Democrats uh, that voted for it, and they're gone, replaced by Republicans, which is how the Republicans took back the Senate. Of course, in Monroe County, in Ontario County, you have Ted O'Brien, some of you may know, uh, who actually campaigned, who was a Democrat, voted in favor of the SAFE Act, even though he had just campaigned a few months before saying, I'm a hunter and I know I'm going to protect your Second Amendment rights. All this happens, by the way, it's not because these people are dishonest waking up in the morning. When you get a phone call from the governor, and the, the governor is very effective at twisting arms, he can be as nice as can be and offer you things for your district. He can promise that you won't have an opponent the next time around. Or he can say, hey, about that fire truck you need for you know, your town fire department. Or the new hospital. And I'll make sure you never get elected to anything again. 
and he can he can flip on a dime, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So we're we're looking short of that we're looking for candidates in all those districts, all those five, and I think by January, February, we've got to identify them if we're going to find them. Other questions? Yes, sir. Governor Cuomo, I'm a store for you. Uh, <laughs> half jokingly, I've been told to look under my car hood before I turn the key on my official. The, the question is, what's Governor Cuomo got in the store for me? You know, I've got a pretty safe district. Uh, I've got a solid Republican district. People voted for me because they've been listening to me on the radio for all these years. I've got three antennas in my district, as we say. Uh, having said that, I see what they've done to Scott Walker and the people around him by concocting charges. I saw what they did to Rick Perry, indicting him on false charges. Uh, I've seen what they've done to uh, Scooter Libby, who worked in the Bush White House. You know, it's a tough world out there. It's a dangerous world. And I think all of us that challenge the governor are well aware that, you know, maybe we're not looking under our car here, but Getting a horse head in your bed? We, uh, there might be a horse head in your bed someday, all right? <laughs> Other questions, and then I'll wrap it up. So I want to make sure Paloma talk. Yeah, uh, you you mentioned you had the one question about the pistol permit recertification. Um, this kind of goes with what Paloma is working on too. But uh, New York is flagging so many people, uh, you know, kind of in secret under the mental health thing in, in the ISAR system. Uh, what is the recourse if, when we go to recertify, suddenly we find out magically? Yeah, that we're on this system, even though we've never done any of the things that you mentioned. I'll let Paloma answer that, but I'll tell you, I have a stepson who is a uh, combat marine, a 0311 in Afghanistan, and his purple heart, and has a little PTSD. And when you, he, he is currently applying for a pistol permit. When you apply, you probably are aware, you have, essentially have to sign away your HIPAA rights and do full disclosure. And we've been waiting for a long time for him to get that permit approved. And I know he's gone through the sheriff's background check and all that stuff, and the sheriffs don't have a problem. But this is why judges matter. Your county judges, so you've got some, like even Seneca County, that are putting restrictions on permits. I mean, surprisingly, some very rural parts of New York State where you think you wouldn't have any trouble with Bristol permits, you've got Democrat judges who are restricting permits as opposed to, to no restrictions. And the, the answer to your question, the question for those of you in the back was, when we go through the pistol permit recertification, are we going to encounter situations where you discover, you didn't even know before, that you're on a do not buy list or some kind of restricted list? I'll let Paloma answer that. But I think, but the answer is I don't think we know yet. Because is it provided for the safe bet? The answer is no, there shouldn't be a problem. The problem is, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the governor, through the state police, is effectively developing a parallel pistol permit system. So the state police find out about every one of the research that comes along. I don't think our county clerks are going to be the problem, or the, or the you know, whatever the local research process is as provided in the Safe Act. The problem is the governor is, gets the camel with the nose under the tent, using the state police then to get a copy of every research application that they will review, and Lord knows what's in their databases. And this is one of the problems that we're finding is that they're so secret uh, in this administration that you really don't know what the state police and their legal counsel's office are doing. Uh, we know that they've spent $8 million, for example, getting the, the ammo research uh, or, uh, registration done. That's a lot of money. I mean, I don't know any of you involved or have kids involved with software stuff. I mean, you, you can do a heck of a lot with $8 million in software programming. The fact that, that they've, they've sort of disappeared, but you don't know what they do. So you don't know what databases they have done. One last question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Any chance I don't run for governor? <laughs> uh, I'm going to support Chris Gibson. <laughs> I'm going to support him. No, I'll tell you, there's a reason I didn't run until I was 55. I just, by, by personality, a lot of people have asked me, where's Dr. Savage today? Uh, I do the radio show with a lot of us. It, it takes a certain kind of personality that's willing to crisscross New York State for a year, okay? And a certain kind of wife that's willing to put up with that. And, uh, and a certain, you know, perseverance and a, and a fire in the belly to do it. I, I'm more, if, if you listen to my radio show, I like researching things and understanding what's really going on, sort of the story behind the story. 
And people who are running for office need people like me to help them out. Now, Chris Gibson may not want to have me, but you know that's that's a rule that I feel more comfortable with. Uh, so when people have asked me that question, my answer is rather than being the person in the room, I'd rather find the next five people that are going to be in that room and use my leverage because that's that's sort of how I was brought up as a as a volunteer. Uh, on political campaigns, I would rather get five good people in than myself be in for a period of years. And, and frankly, in the long term, and for all of you in this room, whether it's the Conservative Party or the Republican Party or, God help you, the Democrat Party, it doesn't really make much difference. You can be, over a long term period, much more effective as a volunteer and a party person identifying those good candidates and making sure they win elections the judges, the county legislators, the county supervisors, uh, you know, along with the state reps and people like Catco. Remember, if we weren't Catco, we'd have Dan Buffet, who loved Barack Obama. Well, Catco doesn't have a lot of money, but he's the congressman, because there have been Bill Nojays all over that congressional district working away to make sure that Catco made it, even though the Syracuse newspaper was obviously against him. You know, they kept playing up that thing where somebody stole a gun out of his car as if though it was a high crime and misdemeanor, okay? The media is not on our side. So uh, we, we need the, the conservatives, the Republicans, the judges, all these candidates, they need you to get involved. Join your local Republican or conservative party committee and get involved in candidate selection. Quite frankly, we've got Mike Nazolios and Jim Sewards because more of us are not involved with party committees. When we're in the room, they get pushback. And I, I think De Francisco would have been the majority leader. And frankly, if he would have been majority leader, that point that was raised about the New York City rent control was right on. I've talked about it on the radio show. Everybody in Albany knew that there was no, that the Democrats from New York City absolutely had to have. It would have been nuclear Armageddon if they closed out this session without getting that rent control stuff fixed. Because there are hundreds of thousands of people in New York City whose rent is at you know X number of dollars, and it would be five times that if the rent control was allowed to expire. They had to have it. And that was the Republicans' golden opportunity to cram down on Cuomo and the New York City Democrats' reform of the SAFE Act. Paloma was in Albany a half a dozen times. Steve Alstead, the president of SCOPE, was in Albany more than half a dozen times. Other Second Amendment activists. The bills were drafted, by the way. The bills were in the hopper. But John Flanagan, supported by the likes of Nizzolio and Jim Seward and Kathy Young, rolled and gave the governor and the New York City Democrats what they wanted because they didn't have the guts and because they wanted the money for the new fire engine instead of standing up for the, against uh, the safe act. Yes, sir. Uh, I've talked to Nizzolio several times about this matter and his excuse is basically that uh, uh, the governor would have passed, uh, would have done it by executive action so we had nothing. The right control law could not be done by executive action. There's no way that could be done by executive action. I have heard of half a dozen excuses on these people. Right. Kathy Young said, oh, you know, that John T. Francisco, he's a double dipper. I couldn't vote for him. He didn't do anything wrong. T. Francisco didn't do anything illegal or unethical. He, he just played by the rules. But that was the excuse she gave to one Republican county chairman. Others have said, oh, well, T. Francisco was objectionable to, uh, he was too conservative for the five members of the, of the Independent Democratic Conference, like Valeski. You know what? I don't think Valeski can care about anything other than Valeski's re-election. So I don't, I don't believe that line either. So, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I respect that you're saying it, but I don't think that's... that's no, Nizzolio, look, Nizzolio backed Como in last year's election. He did a public relations event in Canandaigua for some economic development project where he wrote off a script saying Andrew Como was the best thing since sliced bread, and he refused. Mike Nizzolio, refused to get his picture taken with Rob Astorino. As did a lot of the other Republican senators. Find me a picture of Jim Seward with Rob Astorino. Find me a picture of Kathy Young with Rob Astorino. They implicitly supported the governor's re-election. And they refused to stand with us when it came to 
playing hardball with the New York City Democrats over the rent control trade for safe entry Thank you very much. You've been great.